Well, welcome all. I'm uh, going to recite the shooting of Dan McGrew. <laughs> no. Listen, I want to thank you for taking your time to come over here this evening. And, uh, you know, for 25 years we've been saying that the federal government must get its fiscal house in order. So, um, in all the socializing that's going on, there's going to be a little bit of business, and I'm going to be responsible for it here in a few, for a few minutes. It seems so long that our voices were voices in the wilderness, but despite our warnings and determined efforts, spending kept growing, the building deficit kept climbing, with the, and the threat to our economy kept building. And now we've reached the end of the line, and even the other side that used to tell us that deficit spending was good for us now agrees that least in their speeches with us. We've reached an hour of decision when hard choices must be blave and made, and I believe that this budget compromise that we put together with Bob Dole and Pete Domenici deserves your support across the board and without reservation. I know that in a plan which fundamentally restructures a budget built up over decades, everyone will have to swallow hard on one or two items. I did myself. But if we don't stick together on everything, we could end up with nothing. We must keep this package intact because it's the only alternative we've got. A tax increase is not an alternative, no matter how it's described. Loophole closing, revenue enhancement, and excise taxes all amount to the same thing. Trying to close the budget deficit by raising the 19 percent of gross national product we're already taking in taxes when the problem is the 25 percent of gross national product that we're unjustifiably spending. I've said I'll veto any tax increase no bill, no matter how it's disguised, and I will. And the other day I got some backing. Two young congressmen came in to see me with a letter pledging their support of any veto that I might make on any tax increase, and it was signed by 146, the required number. Our obligation to the American people is to cut government down to an affordable size, not raise their tax burdens to even more unaffordable levels than they face now. The other alternative being suggested, a budget freeze, we know is also unsatisfactory. A freeze would fall way short of the mark in savings. It would be temporary. It would permit the deficit to uh, problem to fester and to grow in future years. And it fails to recognize that all spending is not created equal. Spending is so far in excess of our income that we have no choice but to provide for what is essential for our national security and domestic welfare first, and then have the courage to cut out the frills and the dispensable programs entirely. And the first priority must be our national security. We've now agreed to lower the three-year defense spending line by $120 billion, but that's the rock-bottom level needed to continue our defense buildup. The Soviets are far more dangerous than they were 10 years ago, and they continue to arm way beyond the defense needs of their country. And to counter that threat, 3% defense growth each year is imperative. Likewise, our budget compromises, compromise doesn't touch the safety net because those programs were reformed in 1981 and are now targeted to genuine need. So to get the overall budget savings we need, we must go deeper than a freeze in lower priority programs in order to keep the safety net intact. And that brings us to the hard choices. Our proposal is for a leaner, healthier, and firmer budget that keeps what should be kept and cuts what should be cut. Some programs whose costs far outweigh their benefits have been eliminated entirely. Amtrak, for instance, because as you know, every time an Amtrak train leaves the station, you've heard it over and over again, it costs the taxpayers $35 for each passenger. In many cases, it would be cheaper to hand passengers a free plane ticket. The same holds true for the Job Corps the Small Business Administration, and 15 other programs that we've proposed to eliminate entirely. Other major programs have been reformed on the theory that it isn't fair that those with low incomes must subsidize the wealthy. Student aid will still be provided in low- and middle-income families, but aid to the wealthy will be scaled back. Now, many of you said that we must curb the automatic cost of living adjustments and pension programs, and we have. 
with over $30 billion in savings over the next three years. But unlike the current law, our bill would guarantee at least a 2% increase in Social Security benefits, more if inflation picks up. While the low-income elderly, those who are on supplemental, and the disabled will receive full cost of living adjustments. You know that special interest groups will be flooding your offices in coming days. But we have this one great historic opportunity to protect the larger interest of all the people, to clearly identify the Republican Party as the party of courage, the party of leadership, and the party of growth for the future. And this we must do. We've reached the moment of truth. But if each of you personally condemns and votes to kill each item you find unacceptable, the entire $300 billion spending reduction package will be doomed. I hope we can work together, send the right signal of resolve to the markets and the American people and to the world. You know, for a half a century, there have only been four years in that half a century in which Republicans had a majority in both houses of the Congress. And now there's been an additional four years in which we have had one house, your house. So all that's happened and all the buildup and all the things that are wrong have to be laid at one door. And that's the door of the opposition. And lately, for the first time in a great many years, the people of this country in polls are indicating that they believe we're better for the economy than the Democrats are. Now, if we go in there and we start quibbling about this or that, why can't we make up our minds and the only way to go is we have a package and that's it, up or down. I can only tell you, if you haven't been told before, that in our meetings with all of the cabinet, all of those who have to deal with these programs, instead of being in there and plumping for money, we went through and then we let them come back if they had objections, we heard them and we made final decisions that yes, this was the program that we believed could work and that we could make work and do the things that government is supposed to do for the people. So I'm not going to say any more except that maybe for a few minutes here, I haven't seen one of you raise your glass since I started talking. You just stand there. there. All right. Okay. Uh, I'll even take one myself. Uh, orange juice and vodka. Uh, you see, we got good relations with the Soviets. <laughs> The, uh, but uh, maybe for a few minutes, maybe if you've got some questions or something you want to throw, and then I'll get down off of here and we'll mingle. Uh, anyone have a? Yeah. I don't have a question. I want to thank to you. Uh, we believe that uh, you know, we're on the verge of progress. That's what we tell the press every day. We're on the verge of progress. And we've been having meetings almost around the clock, and particularly one of the next talk, and he's taken a lot of heat from a lot of us. And we know it's a very difficult by next Wednesday, we'll start voting. And you're exactly right. If we start nitpicking little pieces of the package, there's no way we can win. The Democrats have indicated to give us any support. And uh, we hope that we can satisfy some of the real concerns that some of our colleagues have on the Republican side. But we're committed to the package. Uh, we're, we're making only minor changes that have been necessary because of some uh, suggestions. So uh, I don't have a question. I think one way to really make this work is for you to go on television early next week and we'll start voting on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> and I think my colleagues would agree to that. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So we, have, we need a lot of help. We need a big avalanche yeah. of mail to tell us to do the right thing. Yeah. I tell you this, I've gotten an awful lot of letters from an awful lot of people out there who might be, uh, you might think that are, would be interested in some of the government programs for themselves. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, they're all saying the time has come and we want to volunteer uh, to help. So somebody else got something? or wanna, If you don't, I'm going to get down on the floor with all of you. Here. No other? Well, Dave came prepared to answer questions. Huh? Yeah. What? What's that? You're my guest. <laughs> there was an administration here that charged for breakfast when they had you fellows over, but no, we won't do that. 
No. I have just a thought. As you prepare your notions for presentation, you want to pick a program that you know is one of the whole priorities. What I have done with these senators, when they get involved here, I've said, now look, here's the way I'm looking at this. If we, if we did not have that program, and we had $200 billion debt, that's growing, would we pass a new law to create the Small Business Administration and amend $2.8 billion? And the answer has been no. Now, I think when you ask the people, would you create Amtrak, which has already cost $9 billion, cost $800 million a year, would your congressman get, get away with that? Would you let them get away with that? With a $250 billion debt? See, the notion is, try all new. Yeah. Now, would you pass it? Because that's the fact. Yeah. That it's all there with the debt. You know, I've told you that, but if the President of Santa Fe told me, the government, they 